You can either live your dreams or live your fears. So you accept the fact that you are afraid and then you move on anyhow. I know that you've got greatness within you. I know that you have unlimited potential in you. I know that you have something to give to the universe. Les Brown's dreams have brought him a long way. Today, he is a nationally known speaker, sought after by corporations and seminar groups. It is not a future anyone would have predicted when Les and his twin brother were adopted at the age of six weeks by Ms. Mamie Brown, a single woman with a motherly heart. Les was the fun-loving, less serious twin and such a poor student that the local school system mistakenly labeled him mentally retarded. But Les finished high school anyway and then discovered that he had a talent for connecting with people that made him a major personality on the radio and a prominent community leader. He then made a successful bid for the Ohio State Legislature, where he served in the House of Representatives for three terms. Today, Les spends his time preparing for the 200 speeches he makes each year, enjoying every minute he can find to be with his children, and developing his new personal growth seminars. Les Brown is still working on his dreams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, boy. I want to talk to you about something that I think all of us can identify with. You can either live your dreams or live your fears. And I think the majority of people actually are not living their dreams but are living their fears. So I want to ask you a question. What are your fears? What are you afraid of? What are you scared of? Because we all have fears, don't we? We all have something that's blocking us, that's holding us back. And as we begin to look at life, what we realize is that the reason that most people are not living out their true potential and not doing all of the things that they would really like to do is because of fear. Some people call fear false evidence or expectations appearing real. I'm reminded of the story of um, a guy that was living in an area where he had some new neighbors and these neighbors had a bulldog. And when he came home every day, this bulldog used to chase him about a half a block from his house. Every day, he would have to streak home. I mean, he would just run. This bulldog would be right on his heels. And so he just got tired of that because he would go home about a half a block away from home. He would look around for this bulldog, and he would see him. And he would go walking casually along, and this bulldog would come out of nowhere. Woo -woo -woo! And start chasing him, he'd run home. So this one day, he just got tired. And so when the bulldog was running after him, he started running, he saw a rock, and he stopped to pick it up to throw at the bulldog. And when the bulldog got up on him, he started barking, he realized the bulldog didn't have any teeth in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> then he started chasing the bulldog. If you don't get all the way from it, because <laughs> the most the bulldog could have done is gummy, you know. <laughs> and so, you know what? Most people go through life running scared. Running scared from things that have no teeth in them <laughs> because they're false expectations appearing real. That see, we're brilliant enough to scare ourselves to death. You realize that? And there are some people actually who get a kick out of scaring themselves to death. <laughs> I remember the last frightening movie I saw. It was The Exorcist. I will never forget. <laughs> I was so frightened when I came home. I'll never forget, I drove in the driveway and I had already called my former wife and said, listen, turn the lights on. <laughs> I was coming in the driveway and I, and I was getting out of the car and all of a sudden I couldn't get out. I started blowing my horn. I said, Madeline, they got me, they got me. <laughs> she came to the kitchen and said, take your seatbelt loose, fool. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. I was frightened out of my wits. But there are a lot of people who they get off on that. They love it. I'm a person, I, I, my brother is a paratrooper. My twin brother, he's in the military, a career man. 
I would love to jump out of an airplane to parachute. I'm scared, though. <laughs> I mean, I really admire my brother for that. I would really love to be macho man like that. What are the things that you fear that's been keeping you from living your dream, that's been keeping you from doing some things that you would like to do? Just think about those things. And how do we begin to handle that? Abraham Maslow said that the life is about growth. And he said, you can either go back to your comfort zone, and there you won't find any growth, or you must willing, be willing to go forward and face your fears again and again and again. Because you're never going to have a, a fear-free existence. I mean, some fear is acceptable and legitimate. There are some things that you, you really should be afraid of. Now, you shouldn't allow it to immobilize you. You acknowledge it, you take it into account, and you carry yourself accordingly. There are times that we should proceed with caution. But it's the difference between being stopped by fear. It's the difference between having a fear and the fear having you. So what do we do? One, acknowledge it and knowing that it's okay. Don't condemn yourself for being afraid. It's perfectly fine to have some fears. You acknowledge your fears, you embrace those fears, and then you move on. You act on whatever it is that you fear. Because once you embrace it, see, what you resist will persist. What you resist will persist. So one of the most important things is, is to begin to embrace your fear. The fear of bodily harm, that's legitimate. When I was a disc jockey in Columbus, Ohio, you know, I was young, about 22, 23, thought I was tough, and I was on the air, and Al Green, who was a great performer at that time and still is now, now singing gospel music, had a record. His first hit record was Backup Train. So a guy came in the town and was impersonating Al Green. I happened to know Al Green because I'd already booked him. And so when I found out this guy was impersonating Al Green, I came on the air and did an editorial about him, and I exposed him. He was a rather um, big fellow, and so he um, had the word out <laughs> that when I see this guy less from the disc jockey, I'm going to knock him in the mouth for having a big mouth. So I was driving down Main Street in Columbus, Ohio, had my son in a car, and I always had this little saying, hey, if anybody ever put a threat on me, I'm going to make them honor it. So I saw this guy in the street. So I pull around. I said, excuse me, I'll be right back. Got out of the car. I said, hey, man, I heard you said that you were looking for me. I'm Les Brown. He said, you are? I said, yeah. I said, what is it? I'm the one that said that you are an imposter. I said, I want to know what you're going to do about it. He opened his coat and he had a gun there. I said, but whatever I said to hurt your feelings, I want you to have <laughs> Acknowledge your fears, carry yourself accordingly. <laughs> and do what makes sense for you. Well, one major fear I've always had is a fear of the dentist. And this fear had me. I didn't have that fear. And what really reinforced it, you got to watch things that can feed your fear. I saw a movie that most people would not remember. This movie was starring Dustin Hoffman. It's called The Marathon Man with Laurence Olivier. When I mean, he's trying to get a confession out of here. And he took this drill out. Let me tell you something. When he went in Duffman Hoffman's mouth with that drill, I had a dollar worth of popcorn. <laughs> that popcorn went everywhere. Oh! <laughs> Do you know I could not go to the dentist for five years? I had left broadcasting, went to the Ohio legislature, had an impacted wisdom tooth. Now that hurts. And I would call, and as soon as the people would answer the phone, I would hang up. That's how frightened I was. Dr. Hamler's office, boom, I'd hang up. <laughs> then I got to the point where I could just ask for an appointment, hello? And I wouldn't give my real name. <laughs> because I knew I wasn't going to keep it. <laughs> I'd give anybody's name, Joe Jiggly Jim, it didn't matter. Then pretty soon I got to the point where I could give my name. It was about four years after that, you know? <laughs> said, my name is Les Brown. Then I would call back and say, look here, due to my legislative agenda, I won't be able to make it. So the lady finally said on the phone, she said, you're scared, aren't you? I said, no, I'm not. She said, then why don't you come in? I said, that's none of your business. <laughs> 
She said, you're not coming in because you're scared. I wish you just would not waste our time. And she hung up. I said, you have no right to do that to people like me, you know? So finally, make a long and short of it. I was hurting so bad. I said, wait a minute, I've got to do something. And I said, what am I afraid of? Go there and handle it. I said, man, I said, Dr. Hamill, I just can't hear this drill. I mean, if you can do whatever, I just don't, I don't need to hear this drill, this drill, that sound, you know, that's the, what gets me, that drill. Don't pull that drill out on me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, just calm down, calm down. And it wasn't really bad as I thought it was. One of the things you find out that when you face your fears, it's not as bad as you think it is. And when people tell you, I, I just can't do it, I, I can't handle it, I mean, really, 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 I can't handle it, what they're envisioning is that they're not going to be here. They're going to clock out like you're going to die. And guess what? We all had occasions when we confronted our fears, we had to do something we felt uncomfortable with, we didn't want to do it, and we did not die. They didn't come take us and put us in a box somewhere. Am I right? So what we've got to begin to do, how do we handle that? What's the process? Because it's all up in here. One, I think, is imagine the worst case scenario. I just imagine that he went in my mouth and with this drill and that I just croaked out. <laughs> 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 then I imagine, that's the worst case scenario. Then I had another technique I used. Visualize yourself being more than able and capable of handling it. And I used to have a tremendous inferiority complex about speaking before people that I felt who had more going for them than I did. Because I'm not college trained, I used to feel that college people were the most intelligent people on the planet. And there was nothing I had to say for them. And what will, I, what will they listen to me for? That's the way I felt. And so I had to, to visualize myself speaking before them, speaking before various audiences that had more going for them than I did, and realize and appreciate my own value and that I was a worthwhile person even though I didn't have all going for me. I didn't have the money, I didn't have the education that they had. So part of the process is seeing yourself being worthy, being capable, having what you need to make you a worthwhile person and that you're more than able and that you deserve to be listened to, or you deserve to have that dream and that passion and whatever it is that you see and envision there. You've got to see it in your mind's eye and know that you've got what it takes. Repeat after me, please. I must see, I must see in my mind's eye, in my mind's eye see, myself see myself confronting my fears, confronting my fears handling, my fears, handling my fears. I'm more than able. I'm more than able. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you got the right stuff. So deciding as you look at your life, as you look into the future and say, what fears am I holding on to? What fears that I'm allowing to imprison me that's keeping me from breaking out, that's keeping me from living up to my true potential, that's keeping me from really being happy, that's keeping me from having a sense of adventure and excitement in my life. What's, what's keeping me from controlling my destiny? What fears that I'm giving that permission to? Notice what I said, that we must give our permission to fear to immobilize us. Because whatever discomfort you experience, whatever challenges or difficulty that it is, you got to handle it. Got to go up in there and wrestle with it. Will it be easy? No. Will it be challenging? Yes. A friend of mine who's going into recovery, he's been addicted to crack cocaine for years and alcohol. And he was talking about how challenging it was and why he was dreading going, on, going into cold turkey. I said, what do you want me to tell you? That it's going to be a picnic? No, it's not. It's going to kick your butt? Yes, it is. Are you going to want to die? Yes, yes, that's a part of it. But that's just what you must go through in order to get where you want to go. And guess what? You are strong enough to do it. You're strong enough. And your life is worth whatever you have to go through to get past this addiction. Whatever you have to do. This dream you got, whatever you want to do, 
Will it be easy to just run out there and do it? No. Will it happen overnight? No. Will it be a struggle? Yes. Will there be times when you can't make ends meet? Yes, that's a part of it. Will there be times you won't know what to do? Yes, that's a part of it. Will you have some opposition? Will things go wrong sometimes? You will have many visits from Murphy. <laughs> now, if you say, well, who's Murphy? Don't worry. <laughs> Somebody must have told us someplace along the line, I don't know where, but somebody must have told people, oh, life is going to be real easy. <laughs> no. If they told you that, I've got a special announcement. <laughs> they lied. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll never forget, I had a special piece of legislation I wanted to get passed, and I said to a guy, I said, look here, can I count on your vote? He said, yes, and look here. If I can't count on it, let me know there's another guy that owes me a chip, and I can call on that. And I won't need your vote, but I do need it if you say you're going to do it, do it. He say you can count on it. Legislation came up. He voted against my bill. My bill passed. I went back to him and said, hey, I told you I needed the vote, but if you couldn't give it up, let me know. I would get somebody else. I said, why did you tell me? He said, I lied. <laughs> I was in shock. How many of you that life just wore you out? That you didn't expect that? You thought you'd go to school, get good grades, get a job? And you came out here and you'd be able to get a job and live happily ever after? And you say, they lied. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> they never told me. You know that song say, Mama told me there'll be days like this? <laughs> they didn't even tell us that. You know something about life is challenging. I mean, it's some stuff you get out here, you didn't read it in a book nowhere. Didn't nobody warn you that it was going to come down on you like this. That's called life. There are all kinds of challenges like that. So what's the, the next piece is that you accept yourself, then you accept the fear as a fact and not a force. See, when you accept yourself and you accept fear as a fact, that means that it's something that happens, it's something that you're going to experience, but it is not a force to hold you back. It doesn't have any special power other than that that you give it. So you accept the fact that you are afraid and then you move on anyhow. You move on past it, and you do whatever you've got to do. I was at a big motivational rally for a gentleman by the name of Dexter Yeager down in the Carolinas. I was standing backstage, and I had to go out. I was the last speaker on the program. It's the first time I'd been in a stadium of this size, over 10,000 people. You couldn't see the people because the lights are just blaring in your eyes, called Free Enterprise Day. I was afraid. My heart was beating fast. I was just pacing back and forth. And Dexter said, are you all right? I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm all right. So I said, wait a minute. Just calm down. Calm yourself. Hold me, hold me. It's all right, Les. It's all right. All right. Just be as scared as you can be. Mm. <laughs> see, that's why I say embrace that fear. Just try and see how scared you can really get. <sighs> and stop breathing deep. So the guy came back and said, are you about to die or something? <laughs> I said, no, I'm fine. But after I started embracing it and trying to make myself as afraid as I can get and imagine what's the worst thing that I can go out there and do, my mind go blink and I fade on stage. <laughs> That's the longer they gave me my check. <laughs> But once I start laughing at myself, I start talking to myself and say, you know you scared today? <laughs> and I said, I just calmed myself down. And I went out there and I cooked. And that's what you got to do. I had another experience where I was at a major corporation and I was, it was one of my first major presentations I was going to do for this corporation. And I had four other presenters that had large firms. And one of the things that you've got to do is you've got to watch your inner conversation and discipline your thinking and your imagination because if you don't, your mind will take you on a wild trip. <laughs> so my mind said, hey, Les. I said, what? <laughs> these guys are going to wipe you out. You can't compete with them because I heard these guys sitting over across from me and they were talking about all that they had going for them. And so I started doubting myself and I became afraid and I was thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't go in there. And so I knew then, and this is what I suggest to you, sometimes you got to talk to yourself. Talking to yourself, you know, could be a good exercise. It might be the only intelligent conversation you ever get. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I got up and I went to the bathroom. I started talking to myself and said, Les Brown, let me tell you something. What do you care about these guys and their firms and all their money? You've got six children you've got to feed. you got a mama you've got to take care of home. You ain't got nothing to lose. <laughs> I went in that room and looked at those people. I said, don't you do nothing till you hear from me. <laughs> and I got that contract, too. <laughs> you got to do that. <laughs> so when you have your lower self talking to you, telling you what you can't do, part of what you've got to do is be your own motivator. You, and you can't talk casually to yourself. You can't say, I said, now, you must calm down now. <laughs> No, that subconscious mind won't hear that. You've got to have a good conversation to yourself. Hey, and answer yourself, too. Don't pay these people any attention. You answer yourself. Hey, what you gonna do? I'm going there and get off. All right, very good. Go in there and take care of business. You've got to talk to yourself, and you build yourself up, and you'll feel your energy level coming up, and people will feel that around you. See, now, if you go through life being afraid, people can sense that. They can pick up that fear. So that's why you've got to stand up inside yourself. I'm reminded of the little boy that was on a bus and, and some bigger fellows were picking at him, you know? And so he, he wanted to move from by them. They were thumping him on the head. And so he stood up just to get from by them and they would push him back down. And he would stand up again. They'd push him back down. And he stood up again. They pushed him down, held him down. He said, you might hold me down, but I'm standing up inside myself. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you gotta do in life. See, when you are not filling your life with the things that you are capable of doing, see, we all have some stuff that we've been given. And I don't think that it's optional for us to sit on what we have. See, if you're sitting on what you have, what you've been given, and I think everybody's been given something to bring to the planet, that only you can do that, only you can perform that, only you can initiate that activity. And if you don't do that, if you're not filling in your life with your life work or your mission, then there are gaps in your life. And what we do when we're not living out our true identity, we begin to fill the gaps. We fill the holes with garbage, alcohol, drugs, worry, self-destructive behavior. So when you begin to look at your life, and you know that, that you're not doing what you can do because you have allowed yourself to be held captive by your fears. Now, when you don't have a true appreciation and acceptance for who you are, and you allow yourself to be immobilized by fear, what happens in the process is that you begin to abuse yourself. You begin to sabotage your life, you begin to sabotage your dreams, you begin to unconsciously work against yourself you become your own worst enemy. So what do you do about that? Well, you, you begin to realize that your dream and your gifts have so much meaning and so much value for you till your hunger for them will begin to push you past the fear. Your hunger to have them will give you a special drive. As you work on yourself, as you begin to acknowledge your true identity, the true power that you have, the true capacity you have to bring about change, the miracle working power that you have within yourself to do the things that you want to do. When you take them on, I'm reminded of a man who, this gentleman was doing a special study of a special tribe in Africa, headhunters. And he had difficulty in developing a relationship with these tribesmen because of the fact that he had fear. He had fear they were going to take his head. <laughs> I tell you, all fears aren't bad. <laughs> that was a legitimate fear. That was a good fear to give you a headache. <laughs> <laughs> so he worked there for a long time with no effort, no progress in developing a relationship and rapport and being able to achieve a level of trust. So finally one night while he was in bed, he was thinking about it. I said, what, what is it that you came here to do? What is your life work as a missionary? He said, I wanted to study these tribesmen. I said, what's the worst thing that they can do to you? Kill you. <laughs> and he just decided, hey, this is what I came here to do. 
I know that there's some risk involved, and I'm going to do it, come what may. He said, I'm not going to be afraid anymore. He went back the next day, and he started doing the work and trying to talk to and interview many of the members of this tribe. And they began to respond to him. They threw out the welcome mat to him. And years later, when people came to see what his progress was, they asked him, how were you able to do this? How did you convert the relationship from being hostile to that of being positive? And he said something I think has value for all of us. He said, when life can no longer threaten you with death, he said, what else is there? What else is there? And the majority of the fears that we have are not life or death fears. They're not those kind of fears. But through our imagination, we blow them out of proportion and we give them more power than they actually have or deserve and we permit them to govern our lives. We permit them to determine how far we can stretch out on our dreams and discovering our stuff. And as we begin to look at ourselves and, and begin to wait a minute, just getting to the point as you assess yourself and, and begin to prove yourself and just say, wait, hold a minute, hold a minute. I've been sweating this out. What can, what's the worst thing that can happen to me on this? Will it kill me? Will I die? Why, why am I going through all of these changes over this? How much power does this really have? And am I the one that's feeding the power into it? See, a lot of times we, we allow ourselves to be fed and to be programmed into to being afraid. I mean, you watch the news and read the newspaper, you'll be scared to come out the house. <laughs> am I right? You'll be afraid. So what kinds of things, what kinds of thoughts are you feeding your consciousness? What kind of things are you putting in your mind that will enable you to either move forward or to justify why you are staying where you are? Another piece that I look at that when I finally decided that I was going to go to the dentist, the pain was so great, I couldn't hold out any longer. All of a sudden, the fear didn't matter. <laughs> I can't but take me. <laughs> Now, some people need fear, you know. I have a friend that, that we told him, hey, man, you, you know, you need to lose some weight. It, you, you're getting overweight and out of shape, and at our age, we need to have a regular program. And Bud said, man, I, I've been fat since I was a little boy. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm big bone. I've never seen a fat skeleton, though, you know? <laughs> well, Bud became ill. <laughs> How many of you ever seen a fat skeleton right here? I know, all right. Bud became ill, passed out, and um, I was there, and the doctor was talking to him. And Bud, I think, was going to go right back to same old eating habits and doing everything. You know, he said, look here, um, you are a diabetic. He said, now, here's some of the side effects. You know, you could go blind, you can become an amputee. None of that touched him. He said, you can become impotent. He said, what did you say? <laughs> has lost weight, he exercises every day, he's in the body sculpturing. <laughs> 48 years young, he looks great. I can't believe it. But just that one statement <laughs> made all the difference in the world. Bud is a new man today. So what is it that has to happen to you? Some people don't take corrective measures to improve their health until they get a pronouncement that they're about to die. Then they start, okay, all right, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. But they won't do that. They can see people drop it off like flies around them. Well, that's them. You got to go from something. <laughs> <laughs> we go through life really blocking ourselves constantly. And fear is one of the, the greatest instruments that we could use to stifle our true potential. When you begin to, to look at your life, you can decide to, to use fear as a blocker or you can decide to use it as building blocks. That you decide, hey, look here, I'm going to move in this direction. I'm not going to allow anything to stop me from doing what I want to do. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, I'm unstoppable. <laughs> Thank you.
See, when you begin to understand and acknowledge your fear and you go forth anyhow, you go forth in a spirit and a knowing that there's a way that you can begin to handle this. There's a way out here somewhere. There's a solution what it is that you're seeking, that you have the capacity to whatever comes up to handle it, to face it. And rather than feeling powerless, you begin to feel powerful. See, when all of the major downsizings that are taking place around this country, there are a lot of people who are biting their fingers in fear that they might lose their jobs. But there are few people who have decided within themselves, I'm going to make it. Some people aren't waiting to be cut. Some people are moving on their own because they feel within themselves I've got what it takes to make it. They're not afraid about tomorrow because of how they see themselves, because of what they feel that they deserve, because of what they feel that they can create for themselves. Because these people have decided, as they look at the future, as they look at themselves, there's a way. Where there's a will, there's a way for me to begin to create a way out of no way. And when you have that kind of consciousness, when you have that kind of spirit, nothing can stop you. Nothing. What would your life be like as you look toward the future if you decided, I'm not going to allow my fears to stop me? What would your life be like? What would your future be like if you decided to, to want that which you desire so strongly that it prepares you past your fears, that you experience the fear, as the one book says, feel the fear and do it anyway. What would your life be like? And I'm saying to you that all of us who have been entombed by fear have the capacity to resurrect ourselves and to resurrect our dreams. All of us have a capacity to do that. And you have, is it easy? No. It's not easy. Can I do it? Yes. What's one of the ways to get started? Some of us need somebody to hold our hands. Sometimes we need somebody to help us out. Be willing to say, I don't know. Be willing to reach out. Be willing to get some assistance to take you to the next level. What great athlete. You never expect boxers to make profound statements. I think it was Joe Frazier who said this one. He says, all of us are like the blind man at some point in our lives standing on the corner waiting for somebody to lead us across. So all of us, at some point in our lives, need some help, need someone to reach out to us, to throw out the lifeline, to help us go across some treacherous waters that we couldn't navigate by ourselves. None of us do it by ourselves. All of us, at some point in our lives, we need that kind of help. We need that kind of assistance because we grow from the people we have in our lives that can enrich our lives personally, professionally, spiritually, and all the dimensions of our lives. We don't grow in a vacuum. So as you look at yourself, what are the fears you have that maybe you need some help in strengthening yourself in that area as you assess your strengths and your weaknesses, as you begin to approve yourself and your passions and your dreams and your goals and the things that you want, if you decide to experience all of your true potential, as you decide to manifest all of your greatness, as you decide, wait a minute, what, what else is available to me out here if I decided to experience the fear of rejection the fear of no, the fear of failure, the fear of, of standing by myself. What else is available? Of taking a chance, a fear of losing it all. What else is available to me that will bring some extra meaning and value? The fear of people not liking me. You know how many people do things they don't want to do because they want everybody to like them? Everybody's not going to like you. Excuse me, special announcement. Everybody's not going to like you. No, that's, it's, it's just not that kind of world. What, but you know, there are a lot of people who won't take positions on issues 
who won't take a stand for things they believe in, who won't speak up for themselves because they don't want to make anybody mad. Oh, it was Bill Cosby. He said, I don't know what the secret of success is. He said, but here's what I know what the secret of failure is. He said, trying to please everybody. You can't please everybody. But there are people who have the fear of rocking the boat. So they just go alone in life. Just go alone. Well, how do you feel? Well, I don't really want to say. <laughs> how many of you know people like that? Raise your hand. These people aren't living life. They're not truly experiencing life. What do you really want to do? Well, I don't like this, but I guess I'll go ahead on and do it. No. No, life is too short for that. Too short and unpredictable. Moseying through not trying to disturb anything, not trying to shake anything up, not trying to make any waves. You see, there are some people who, ha who come through the universe and their level of contribution and the level of energy they manifest is so small, so inconspicuous, that when they go, you won't even know they left. I mean, there are people who die on jobs and, and you say, hey, where's John? Oh, John's been dead six months. <laughs> You're kidding, no. Is that right? Yeah. I didn't know, why did somebody say, well, I, I guess we didn't miss him. <laughs> but there's some people because of their personality, because of their contribution, because of their, the investment of their time and their energy and the impact they have there, that when they go, everybody will miss them. See, when Mother Teresa checks out, everybody will know. When Rosa Parks, Everybody will know. Nelson Mandela, everybody will know. Why? Because of their contribution. <coughs> See, but there's some people, because their contribution is so small, no one will care. So I'm saying, before you are boxed and buried, decide that you're going to box and bury your fears. Decide that you're going to begin to live life on a new level seeking out new horizons, that you're going to find more love and more joy and more ways to give more to life. Guy said something, I love this. He says, everything a man does for himself, guess what? He takes with him, but everything he does for others, he leaves behind. So when you begin to say, what is it that I want to leave? What contribution that I want to begin to make? What difference do I want to make in life? What is it that I want to do with the rest of the life that I have left? What, what chances I need to take? What risks do I need to begin to embrace? What fears do I need to step on? What areas of my life am I dead right now? What dream? You can either live your dreams or live your fears. You have got to get to a point where you say, I'm sick and tired of living like this. There's got to be more. That's, see, that's when people go out and, and strike out on their dreams. That's when people get out of relationships where they're dying together rather than growing together. That's where they leave jobs. So where are you going? Away from here. I don't know. Do you have another job? No, I don't. What, 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 how are you going to make it? I don't know, but I will. See, you will when you put yourself in that kind of situation. I'm reminded of, of two frogs that, that were hopping down the road and they, they fell into a bottle of milk. And one was hopping up and down for a while and he drowned. He just gave up. But this other frog just kept on kicking. He wouldn't give up. He just kept on kicking. And pretty soon he churned that milk into butter and he walked on out. <laughs> I'm saying when life catches you by the neck and blind slap you, whap and knock you down, I said, just keep on kicking, you know? <laughs> and you can kick on out of those circumstances, whatever they are, not be intimidated by them. Repeat after me, please. I'm going to keep on kicking. I'm going to keep on kicking. I'm going to conquer my fears. I'm going to conquer my fears. I'm never going to give up. <laughs> keep shaking somebody's hand on your right and left and say, keep on, keep it on. Keep on, keep on. <laughs> I tell you, you know, one of the exciting things about life is you got to keep the child in you. Little children dream. We used to go to work with my mama and we would be riding across Miami Beach 
My brother and I be arguing, that's my car. No, that's your car. That rutabaga over there. Eh? <laughs> oh, that's my house. Mama, tell you that's my house. I had that house yesterday. <laughs> How many of y'all did that as kids? Raise your hand. You know? But then after we become adults, life slap you side ahead a few times, and then you don't dream anymore. You know? <laughs> Bigger Thomas in the book, um, The Invisible Man, I think it was, he said, the impulse to dream has been slowly beaten out of me through the experience of life. And most people, ladies and gentlemen, have stopped living their dreams because of the lessons they've learned from life or things they've picked up because we've only been born with two fears. The fear of a loud sound or the fear of falling and all the other fears of fears we learn, fears we pick up. Whatever you're scared of, your life, the value you brought to the planet, far more important than whatever you're afraid of. You're stronger. So as we begin to look toward the future and look at what will it take for us to break through those fears, one, acknowledging the fear, knowing it's all right, some fear is healthy, beginning to know that your dreams, your passions, your drive to achieve whatever it is you want, as it has more power and meaning, it will move you past your fears. As you begin to feel that you deserve it, your passion and goal is so strong the fears won't matter. As you begin to trust yourself and put yourself in the situation where you have to make it happen, you will make it happen. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe this. I know this from my own life experience. I know that you've got greatness within you. I know that you have unlimited potential in you. I know that you have something to give to the universe that was not here before you showed up. Somebody said that life is God's gift to us and how we live our lives is our gift to God. What kind of gift are you giving? And what kind of gift could you give if fear wasn't an issue? And I'm saying, you can have fears, but don't surrender. Don't let your fears have you. You're more than capable of making this your decade. This is Mrs. Mamie Brown's baby boy, Leslie Calvin Brown, saying it's been a plum-pleasing pleasure, as well as a privilege. Thank y'all here.